Good morning and welcome everyone to the first session of NAFTA's 2023 Leadership Summit, Membership Marketing, Practical Approaches for Big Results. We thank you for taking the time to join us today to take a look at ways busy volunteer professionals can take simple steps to boost their membership communications with big results. We would also like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, Banfield Hospitals, for their generous support of this event. A few housekeeping items before introducing our speakers for today's session. On the bottom of your screen, there's a button called Q&A. If you have a question for our presenter at any point during her, the presentation, you can submit it through the Q&A button. There will be some time at the end of the presentation for questions, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. There's also a chat button on the bottom of your screen. You can use this feature to chat with other attendees, but please do not submit speaker questions here as they will not be able to be monitored. Again, all questions for our speakers should be submitted through the Q&A button. The session is being recorded and will be available on the NAFTA website approximately a week after the conclusion of our event. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our sponsor, uh, Rachel Beck, Director of Technician Programs at Banfield Hospital, who will now introduce our speakers. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us here today. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this morning's session. First, I would like to introduce Noah Poissant, Account Supervisor at Marketing General Incorporated, a recognized leading firm in the membership marketing field that provides associations and nonprofits expert guidance on growing and retaining membership. Since rejoining MGI in 2015, Noah has worked with countless associations on developing marketing strategies and analytics to deliver results for his clients. With extensive experience in digital advertising, email marketing, direct mail, lead generation, SEO and SEM, and branding, Noah brings a depth of expertise to help enable clients to achieve results. Today, Noah is also joined by Jana Darling, Vice President Account Services at MGI. A certified direct marketer, Jana has specialized in strategic management and execution of integrated marketing campaigns for over 15 years while building a track record of sustained, sustained success on both sides of association agency partnership. Focused on collaboration and relationship building, Jana has developed marketing programs for her clients that have generated nearly 200,000 new members and millions of dollars in dues and non-dues revenue. Welcome, Noah and Jana, and thank you for being with us today. Yeah, Rachel, thank you for the thank you for the introduction. Really excited to be here today. Okay, well, everyone, let's uh, let's jump right in. Um, I know we have some follow-up sessions uh, later today. So uh, Janet and I are, uh, are really excited to, uh, to be here today and, and meet with you. Um, so as Rachel said, and, and, and Rachel kind of introduced us, um, I'm Noah, hi, uh, Jana's also here. Um, today we're really excited uh, to be here because I think we're gonna have a great session in being able to share with you really what MGI has accumulated over 45 years as an agency uh, working with a lot of association clients, but also for today's session, providing a lot of data-driven winning practices um, that we feel can boost membership communications and really just make a, an immediate impact. Um, so before we dive in, I do just want to give Jana an opportunity uh, to say hello and just wave um, before we dive in. So Jana, say hi. Hi all, thanks for having us here this morning. I'm excited to join you all. And um, Noah's mainly gonna be leading this, but I'll be popping in here and there and happy to answer any questions as we go along. Okay, so Jana, do you wanna quickly just kind of maybe put the group at ease about maybe some of the, the pain points or the frustrations we, we may have seen some folks experiencing the last two years? Sure, I'm happy to. So, um, you know, I think everyone, it's no surprise that the past two going on three years now have been uh, a little rough, uh, you know, with pandemic and, and everything and, you know, recessions and things like that. Um, but one thing that MGI does every year, um, we do the membership marketing benchmarking report. Um, we actually just wrapped up last week the survey for our 15th annual report. Um, we do that in January of every year, um, and then our final report usually comes out in early summer 
Um, so, you know, one thing that we really want, you know, that we track every year is obviously membership trends. Um, there's so much that we look at in this uh, annual report. We're looking at, you know, acquisition and recruitment. We're looking at engagement and renewals and, and you know, what's kind of new in the market. And it really, you know, with 15 years of this now, we're really able to have some strong trend lines um, that we're able to look at and kind of see um, how everything is looking in, in, in the world of, of association membership. And I think, you know, one thing that we saw really positive in last year's report um, was that 38% of associations reported an increase um, in their membership during 2021. Um, that number was just 26% in 2020. Um, and, you know, our hope is that, you know, in this year's report, that's back up over 40 or even higher. Um, you know, we did see this rebound before, you know, the last time that we really saw a dip in membership was in the Great Recession. I think that was in 28, 20, or 2008, 2009. Um, and we saw a very similar rebound following that. Um, and we're anticipating that, you know, we already started to see the beginning of it here. Um, and we're really excited to see that hopefully continue. Um, you know, something that we really saw, um, you know, in last year's report that I think had a lot to do with this is, um, you know, that uh, marketing budgets were returning. A lot of people cut their marketing budgets um, or staff was cut short during the pandemic. And so people had the resources to start marketing again. Um, and I think, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of people took a look at, you know, what they were providing their members and what the value was. And, you know, as, you know, as people couldn't maintain their membership, you know, it's okay, what is most valuable? And I think people really focused on their value prop and how they can provide value to their members um, and I think, you know, that has kind of really been a huge part also of leading to this rebound that we're seeing. So, you know, um, an increase in budget and um, focus on, on membership marketing and membership acquisition um, and a renewed focus, I think, on member value and how to best deliver value. Um, and I think, you know, continuing to focus on those things, we're going to continue to see this overall increase, hopefully in membership in this year and in the years to come. Yeah, Janet, great point. And, and this is one of my favorite slides, um, I think, especially with, with leadership groups to present, because for the last two years, it really probably has been a headache at times for recruitment and retention. Um, and all signs are pointing kind of back to that rebound to Janet's point. So um, it's always nice to hear that the opportunities for recruitment and renewal um, are out there and they're rebounding and things might be getting, I guess we'll call it quote unquote, um, a little bit easier, um, but it's always nice to have the data to, to back it up and, and make everybody feel a little bit more comfortable. So Jana, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the update on kind of, I guess, the state of the, the uh, association space to some extent. Um, so with that said, um, I, one of the core philosophies with marketing general um, is probably pretty simple when you think about it. Um, I think over the course of 45 years, MGI has done a really great job about kind of pioneering the focus um, of what we call the membership life cycle, which is really kind of five tenths. Um, you can see it on the screen. It's awareness, recruitment, engagement, renewal, and reinstatement. And it really takes into account the full membership life cycle. It is everything from the awareness stage when prospects uh, and net new folks are first discovering our associations and our groups through recruitment when they're first choosing to try us um, through engagement, which is obviously a really important opportunity for associations where we're building the member to feel like they belong to our, our group, our association. Um, and then obviously that matriculates and trickles into renewals and reinstatements when we're, we're getting lapsing members deciding to stay with us, or for those that lapse and expire going back in through reinstatement efforts, which is the effort of re-communicating to former members and trying to get them to agree to return to you. So the big thing for today, um, Jana and I have done this a couple of times. We know everyone here is a volunteer. We know everyone's busy. We're scattered at times. There's a lot of things to do. There's a lot of different lists that need to be checked off. Um, so our goal with our session today is to really prioritize the two areas that we know historically through our experiences with clients, 
backed up by data from the membership marketing benchmarking report. Um, we're really focusing on the two areas that we know offer the most impact, especially in terms of um, volunteer leaders and volunteer advocates helping really kind of drive, um, drive these two channels. And those are gonna be, as you can see, um, recruitment and renewal. So we're really excited again to kind of dive in, highlight um, some recruitment and renewal, key findings, opportunities, and even some hacks that we think um, y'all could potentially implement easily and quickly to help again make this impact that we're talking about. So um, with that said, we're gonna dive right into recruitment. So the first thing that we always work with, with groups on um, when it comes to recruitment is being able to answer some pretty basic questions because it's going to be really the blueprint for how we execute moving forward with some of our, our best tactics. Um, so first and foremost, the most important question is going to be, who is our target audience? And it seems very simple, um, but if these five questions are regrouped on, discussed, thought about, brainstormed on, even just one to two times a year, you'll see that things are happening within the answers to these questions that are going to likely dictate um, some of the executables that we have down the road in terms of recruitment. So, you know, a great one is who's our target audience? Are we seeing shifts? Um, are we aware of shifts in the marketplace? Are we seeing membership skew younger? Are we seeing certain geographic areas? Are there certain um, uh, company level memberships that are out there that are joining? So audience is again, a big piece of the pie when it comes to being able to really define your recruitment strategy. And that immediately feeds, you know, what do the target audience members need? How can we meet those needs? Again, this is a really interesting question because what we have found over the course of the experiences Janet and I have had is if you ask this question um, internally, you will often find that associations value certain benefits of membership more than actual prospects. So it's an interesting one to say where we'll see, um, you know, maybe our, our, our online community is the, the greatest thing since sliced bread, um, but members don't find it engaging or they don't participate. So it's, it's great to continue to make sure that we're having conversations around needs. And more importantly, how can we answer those needs now? and continuing to reinforce that value. Um, and, and again, these kind of organically bleed into each other, but another big point that we need to emphasize that we have communication and brainstorming on is, you know, what will we offer them? This coincides with needs for many. Um, in a lot of instances, it's prospects are gonna have specific pain points. They want their professional association to answer those pain points now, quickly, easily, um, and I think it just kind of reinforces this society that we live in now where everything's kind of at our fingertips. Um, association benefits should, to some extent, kind of follow that, that procedure. Um, in other cases, with recruitment, an offer can be um, discount. We know that there's a lot of folks out there um, on the association kind of target map that are price sensitive and, and some things like discounts can work. So those are conversations we need to be having. Um, and again, why should people be joining? We need as association uh, professionals to be able to reinforce how we can meet needs today and reinforce that as the, the why you should join. Janet and I lovingly call it, as we'll see in a few slides, um, the what's in it for me. Um, what does membership provide me today? What can membership do for me today? What pain point can membership in Association X uh, provide for me today? Um, and then lastly, to you know, how do we invite them to join? Again, big strategic shifts um, don't come around often, but as these conversations happen from top down, from target audience to needs, to how do we offer um, benefits to them and how, and how do we reinforce value? It's important to 
make sure we're recognizing where our target market is living. Um, Non-traditional um, means of joining are, are, are a lot more popular than they used to be, the social medias of the world. And we call it an omni-channel or a multi-channel approach, being in different places at different times to meet people where they are. Um, again, these conversations are all gonna kind of blend into this, this strategy of how we execute uh, moving forward. So um, Jana, is there anything you wanted to add to the recruitment aspect? Uh, no, I think you covered it well there. Okay. At least that Perfect. intro part. Okay. So now we get in, into the really fun part. Um, you know, what we wanted to do is just reinforce for you all today through a lot of experience, a lot of data, and a lot of association clients, some of the most common object objections to why prospects don't join. And I think, again, a lot of this, we're going to get there in a moment. Um, you know, we are seeing through data shifting demographics, and we're learning ways to overcome some of these objections. So for example, um, we're seeing more younger members in the association space, and they're not necessarily traditional male joiners. So the first bullet we have on here as to why prospects don't typically join is there, it's never going to be from a single offer. Um, we need to be in multiple places at multiple times, asking people, asking our prospects to join, which is the second most common reason folks don't join your association. There is no one asking them directly for the join. Um, oftentimes what we see is there's a lot of messaging around learn more, um, check out our website, but going out asking for direct join has actually been one of the, the, the key finders in how to drive um, membership growth. And to the comment on the, the younger demographics too, it really just goes back to the needs and the pain points and being able to answer the what's in it for me now. Younger members are very savvy, um, but they also look at associations sometimes and they, they see confusing value proposition. They struggle to find perceived value that why should I join? What am I getting out of membership? Um, and in, so, in a lot of instances too, you know, that it's that I don't need to belong. Um, so again, reinforcing the why association membership is important, whether that you're working in a profession that requires CE membership provides um, excellent CE opportunities. You know, these are probably and arguably the three most common objections uh, to why members don't join. Jana, I saw you come off mute. Anything yeah, I to was add? Just, I was just going to add, um, you know, one of the um, senior vice presidents of our company, um, every time he talks about this is, you know, the question is, uh, you know, how many of you woke up this morning and said, gee, I really need to join an association today. It's just not something that people think about every day. And that's really why it seems so simple. But asking people to join, inviting people to join. You know, sometimes that language works really well. And what we found in our efforts is you're invited to join us, you know, so it feels like it has some more exclusivity to it or something like that, um, that they get to be part of this special group, right? Because, you know, we did see, you know, the older generations had this very strong sense of belonging. Um, you know, being a part of a membership was just something they did, their professional association. Um, and it's not that the younger generation is not joining it's just they need a little bit more and they they expect more out of it i think um you know they are not just joining because they 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 can say oh i'm a member of this right that used to be the thing you know you walk around well i'm a member of this association and just that name alone was really beneficial now it's like but but this i need also to get something back from them i don't just want the name to say i'm a member i want to say i'm getting you know this education i'm i'm meeting this um a uh, requirement to maintain a certification. Um, I, you know, there's a network of people that I'm able to talk to and connect with when I have challenges and things like that. So it's just really important to not only ask, but like he said, to also really convey that value and make sure that then once they're a member, we'll talk about this, that they're engaging in that value so that when it comes time and their year is up and it renews, they're like, wow, I found a ton of value in this this year. Yeah. 
no, Jana, those are those are those are great points. So, you know, how do we take objections and how do we kind of turn them into growth opportunities? Well, you know, tactically speaking, we ask them to join and we do it in multi-touch, multi-channel. Um, that is arguably, again, probably the single biggest impact um, that you can do in your recruitment efforts. Um, don't be focused on single channel opportunities. Um, so whether that be just pushing out emails. Um, we, so a great, well, emails are a great example, um, but we like to say, you know, emails do the job, but at any given time, we're getting maybe 15 to 20% of our audience communicating with us or reading our emails. So the more places we can be, the more places we can promote recruitment opportunities and join value proposition messaging, the better, um, you know, highlighting member benefits on social media, highlighting uh, member benefits on websites, um, being present in, in even some chat forums. We've seen some groups participate um, in forums such as Reddit, um, obviously, people are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Being on the multi-channel bandwagon is 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 going to be absolutely key um, in in driving membership growth. But it's also one of the single best places to reinforce your value proposition messaging um, and using that. This is the what's in it for me. So you'll see the acronym um, that we put on here, but really being able to promote, really define, elaborate, and then test certain value proposition messaging um, across different channels um, is obviously uh, very indispensable. Um, the other thing too is with, I think the membership file for, for a lot of groups starting to skew a little bit younger, we have to show that associations are indispensable. And one of the really interesting I think shifts, and Jana, you can jump in here too, that I think is happening right now actually, is this influencer testimonial kind of compensation style indispensability value proposition messaging. Um, the younger generations of folks might not have that sense of belonging, but one of the things that, 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 that pushed them along a little bit more is seeing how valuable it is to people that they look up to, that they aspire to be. Um, so I never thought I would say this in a professional presentation, um, but with influencer marketing, Kardashians, <laughs> um, you know, promoting certain product and having followers follow along just for the sake of following that influencer um, is actually something really interesting too. So if there's opportunities even locally um, with chapter or affiliate personnel who are recognizable, well-known, important in the industry to get little testimonials or blurbs on why they find the, their membership, their NAFTA membership valuable and indispensable um, could be great tactics to help you use snippets like that in recruitment um, opportunities and, and growth promotions. Jana, anything to add there on the influencer in front? I know I never thought I would say Kardashians in my life on a professional presentation. No, I mean, and that's just you know, <laughs> something that, that's happened. And, and that the some of the issue with that is it's, it's a more organic thing, right? You know, that, that people are out there talking. But the one thing I would say there is if you have, you know, well-known people in your field or, you know, people who are heavily engaged in social media and they're, you know, they have a big following and they're also members of NAFTA, you know, how can you, you know, get them to talk about it and the value um, to their followers? But it is, it's, it's tricky. It's not as easy as saying, you know, we're going to send out an email. We're going to put something on our website. You know, it comes kind of more organically unless you're, you know, you have somebody who's already kind of out there and has a following who, you know, you might be able to work with, you know, in many cases, I think we all know this, those people are being paid, right? Companies are paying them um, to talk about, you know, their products and things like that. And it can be done the same way with associations. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent points there. Um, so to get into the hacks, I mean, this is really the, the, the down and dirty for, for busy folks, volunteer leaders who 
are looking for opportunities to tweak programs, edit, alter programs to really make and, and make more of an impact. But I did want to put on this particular slide that one of the key findings that came out of last year's uh, membership marketing benchmarking report was that the more likely you are to attract millennials and Gen X people to your membership, um, the more likely you are to see membership growth. So really associations that had, I think the foresight or the value proposition um, opportunities to really focus and recruit millennials and Gen X, that's where we're seeing a correlation between groups that have experienced membership growth and folks that have experienced decline. And as you can see from the little graphic there, you know, the millennial and Gen X membership roster numbers across the board are increasing while obviously I think the core of the association membership market for a long time, which was baby boomers, um, is declining as they age out of the workforce and they kind of age out of the need for a professional association. Um, so a lot of this has been centered on recruitment hacks that can build on some of these younger member opportunities um, with tactics that we know can work for them. They're very savvy. Please make sure we're speaking <laughs> to our prospects personally. Personalized emails, value proposition messaging that answers pain points for today. Things that we know we can define as a benefit that can show value immediately. These are very basic steps that we can take nearly immediately that can, that can drive response rates and yields and conversions up. Um, and like we mentioned too, ask for the join. Don't be afraid to ask for the join. We've done a lot of research with clients and a lot of data with digital advertising, paper advertising, renewal advertising, um, and, and mail, where asking for the join makes all the difference in the world. And with this group of people too, there's a lot, of, there's a lot happening um, digitally in their inboxes, even in their mailboxes as mail kind of makes a, a stickier comeback as the digital space gets a little bit um, more dense. Um, but always make sure we're creating a sense of urgency in everything we do related to recruitment. Um, deadlines make a difference. Joining by, April 30th makes a difference. Um, so always make sure we're having a deadline and that sense of urgency integrated into everything we're doing from a marketing perspective when it, when it comes to recruitment. Um, as Jana mentioned, as I mentioned, you know, we wanna be omnichannel too. We wanna be sending emails. We wanna be promoting um, recruitment opportunities organically through social. We want to be doing video. We want to be building in testimonial videos to websites and social media channels, um, sharing that across social media platforms. Again, just reinforcing the idea of having our association value proposition in as many places as possible where we can meet people where they are so we're not chasing them down. Um, again, the biggest thing is just continue to reinforce value. I'm gonna go back to it over and over and over until we're all very clear. The what's in it for me now, you know, member benefits benefit me now with X, Y, and Z. Um, that kind of goes to that societal instant gratification I'm joining the association for resources that, that get me to this next step in my career, the next step um, wherever. Okay, so just uh, a couple really solid recruitment hacks that Jana and I have a lot of data and experience to say we know that can work. So when it comes to recruitment, just to kind of put a nice little wrap up on this, you know, as we talk about our target audience, have the conversation with yourself and your chapter folks, but just understand that there's likely this larger shift that it's going younger. Um, Tactically, how do we how do we meet the younger audience where they are? Um, make sure that we're meeting their needs. Understanding the what's in it for me. What do the audience folks need? 
um, offering them answers to their pain points today. And I always put in there in some cases, yes, price sensitivity means discounts, um, but discounts don't necessarily have to be on membership dues. Um, a lot of the times too, an offer could simply be join us at one of our local chapter events. It's usually members only test drive membership. Those are offers too that can make a significant impact in taking a prospect from a prospect to somebody who's now engaging with you and finding value for themselves. Um, and then from a recruitment perspective too, just make sure we're involving digital. Um, we don't wanna be single channel by any means, but the more places we can be, the more opportunity we can have to meet people where they are, the better. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I've been following the chat here um, and, and Q&A as it comes up and tries to answer questions. And it, it seems like many of you are all over social media. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. Um, you know, definitely continue that, but, you know, try not, you know, to make it your only channel as well. Um, not everyone's on, on social media, you know, not everyone, you know, I always say now like email and social media are almost the overwhelming channels out there. Like I can't even, I get through all my emails in a day that comes through my personal email, everything that kind of ends up in my promo email and Gmail usually just gets deleted without being read. Um, <laughs> But there, you know, there's less noise now in, in actually mail, sending a postcard. My my mailbox is nearly empty every day because now everything's an email. So, you know, like Noah said, just, you know, make sure you're using um, both channels. But I'm really happy to see everyone seems very engaged um, on social. So that's that's wonderful. Excellent. But oh, I'll, uh, you know, we're already at 1030 here now, so I'll let you hop right into renewal. <laughs> so um, similar to acquisition, guys, you know, renewals is also um, a huge place where we can tactically execute some changes for higher yield. Um, so a lot like acquisition, when, I, when we talk about renewals and we're talking to chapter leaders or we're talking to association executives, you know, we always start with renewals and we ask the, obviously the basic questions, renewal rate, are we communicating to people multiple times? Um, do we have a process in place for, for you know, reaching out and following up with lapsed members? So, you know, these are questions, again, I think I always reinforce, you know, follow up on these questions, you know, one to two times a year, have strategic brainstorming sessions. But for today's purposes, and also, Jana, thank you for timing purposes, I, I do want to make sure we hit the uh, the what's in it for y'all and, and some opportunities, you know, maybe you could walk away with uh, for your own programs. But listen, a lot like acquisition, there is very consistent and common objections to membership renewals. And I know probably everybody here has heard these a million times. Number one, I forgot. Nobody told me I didn't get the 37,000 emails you guys sent. Um, you know, people are busy. I, I love um, our executives comment about nobody wakes up to join an association because we also use it for renewals when we say, not everybody's waking up remembering that they have to renew their professional association membership today. So um, that, that's a huge objection. Um, another one we see all the time is, is folks looking to get uh, company POs or purchase orders to go through accounting. The biggest ones, guys, y'all can appreciate this. Lack of perceived value, people not using their benefits, even lack of ongoing lapsed member communications. Um, you know, that's one of those ones where just because people expire, you know, let's not forget to continue to pursue them. Um, you know, obviously, I think we all understand it's easier to retain members than it is to kind of go back through the process of reacquiring, cultivating, nurturing, and, and getting folks to rejoin. Um, but, but these objections are kind of systemically um, overcomable or, or we can we can overcome these um, with a couple of hacks. But I will say one thing that was interesting that was an update in last year's membership marketing benchmarking report, it, it was this idea of making sure that ongoing communication to non-renewed members continues after they expire. Um, and I found that 48% of individual uh, associations that installed a strict communication program 
in the two to three month grace period following an expire were 80% more likely to have a renewal rate above 80%. Um, so it's, it's important to make sure that as people fall off the membership roster that we're continuing to communicate with them. So some hacks that we know work very well that, that get more folks into that 80% annual renewal rate um, is quite honestly, it's starting early and often. Um, we often recommend as an agency that there be anywhere from six to nine total renewal touches across multiple channels. Um, typically, this includes obviously email, mail, and social media, um, including mail is a huge component um, to the renewal program. Um, additionally, having invoice style creative is, is, is actually an interesting piece of the renewal hack too. Um, there's a lot of folks who during the renewal process, um, when they receive invoices, you'd be surprised how many people just pick it up and they kind of uh, auto renew themselves. Um, Jana, anything to add with kind of the, the cadence for starting early and often? No, I think um, Noah covered it here. Um, yeah, I think the one thing that we've learned in, in a lot of renewals is that it's really hard to lose money in a renewal. Um, so, you know, I see the comments. Yes, I know postage is, is a killer and the cost yeah. of postage are now going up usually twice a year um, at this point. Um, but, you know, something else, you know, you can monitor to figure out is, is how people respond. And, and I know, you mm -hmm. know, you're, this is a you know volunteer and you're not a full-time job here monitoring this, but you know, how are most of your people renewing? How are they communicating? The one big thing I always just like to add is, you know, if, if all of your renewals are emails and you have a 50% a 50 open rate, you know, how are you reaching those other people that aren't opening the emails? Um, so, you know, making sure that you're saying it in front of everybody um, so they know. And so whether that's, you know, if they don't open an email, you're doing um, a website or a, a phone call um, or, you, you know, you're just doing a mailing to them or, you know, you, you're hosting an event and you have the list of all the people who haven't renewed um, there so they could take action when, when they're at the event, mm -hmm. you know, just making sure that you're, you know, it goes back to the, the multi-channel that you're able to reach these people kind of wherever they are is, is really important. Yeah, no, great, great uh, input there, Jana. Thank you. Um, yeah, so again, I, I would say especially with, with email marketing, you know, I think there's an opportunity at times to set up programs in advance and kind of have them run um, in an automated capacity. Um, but I did want to, you know, bring to the table, we recently, MGI as an agency, recently worked with a client who progressed from three emails um, for their members pre-expiration um, so leading up to their expiration, we had three reminder emails in place. We moved that to six, um, simply because one of the things we were finding is people weren't opening emails um, as often as we would like them to. So we added more emails to the series in hopes that people would obviously uh, uh, recognize these emails a little bit more and engage with us better. Um, and over the course of the last year, that simple change doubling our pre-expire renewal notice reminders helped this particular association increase their on-time renewal rate from a cumulative 48% to a cumulative 59%. Um, and these were people that we weren't seeing necessarily renew after the fact either. So imagine uh, the surprise and the success that we had with nearly an 11% lift in on-time renewal simply by just communicating a little bit more. Um, some associations get a little bit worried that we may be over-communicating, um, but with renewals, it's, it's typically not a problem. Um, um, so, so that was uh, just a case study we wanted to share that was uh, interesting to show the benefit of just kind of re-communicating and trying to overcome that I forgot to renew um, ideology. 
Another thing too with renewals, it's not necessarily part of the renewal series in general, but it falls under the engagement category. Um, having welcome calls to new members when they join have been shown to create a significant impact on the back end when it comes to renewal rates for those people who received those welcome calls. So as we're onboarding new members, having staff, having board members um, pick up the phone, welcome new members to the association and reinforce um, certain membership benefits that we know people participate in most can be a great opportunity to kind of set yourself up for long-term renewal success. Likewise, even checking in with those same members mid-year. Uh, a lot of times mid-year is not too uh, far before they enter into a renewal series anyway, typically three to four months uh, prior to their expiration. But mid-year check-ins are another great way to get a cost-effective plan in place through staff or board members just to reach out to folks and, and check how their membership is going. It gives you an opportunity in real time to hear objections, um, issues with membership, and maybe kind of get corrective action in place to, to, to get members moving in a better direction to engage with your benefits, find value, and then really have a little bit of a stickier feeling about renewing their membership because they're, they're seeing the value of their membership benefits. Um, so another great and interesting hack is consider having unique renewal series introductions for first year members. Um, again, a, a little bit of a case study. We worked with a group not too long ago where we put all of their first year members into a renewal series where messaging was a little bit different and it, it was reinforcing the value proposition messaging um, for those folks we hope to engage with. X, Y, and Z over the first year, or if data allows, being able to have very personalized content to the point of, you know, Jana, we appreciate um, that you were able to take 13 courses this year and participate in 56 discussions through our online community. Make sure you don't lose, um, lose that value. But that also combined with even just some videos on the basic renewal process. You know, we understand you folks might be going through the renewal process for the first time. We're here to help. Um, let us know if you need assistance. Dedicated email series like that specific to renewals for first year members can also create a huge boost. It's reinforcing value, but it's also letting people know that they have that kind of personalized connection. They know you're reaching out to them. Um, as having done this or having gone through the renewal process for the, the first time. So um, just a couple of the, I think, lowest hanging fruit opportunities to really make a, a big impact on, on renewals. Um, so moving on, um, Jana, I'll let you handle this. I, I will say we're going to have, uh, I think, a handout yeah. for the larger group that MJ is going to share here. But um, this is just a reminder of, of, you know, how best to do marketing. You know, obviously there's very kind of core numbers and metrics that we need to understand that help drive strategy. So Jana, I don't know if you want to add anything else. Sure. To, yeah, to just this. quickly, because um, I, I want to get to some questions here, questions. you know, um, want to make sure that, you know, you understand the math of your organization, right? You know, because that really can guide some of your, your marketing efforts, right? Um, especially when you're trying to determine budget or, you know, did something work, did it not? Um, and so, you know, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we'll be sending out a um, PDF that will have all of these calculations and kind of explain them. But these are the thing four that we think are most important. So the renewal rate, which is how many of your members are renewing every year. Um, the response rate, which is really is how successful are your efforts, right? So if you send an email to 100 people and 10 joined, you know, you have a 10% response rate. Um, the lifetime value is a calculation that we use a lot because that determines, you know, for Jane Doe, who's a member, how much value over the lifetime of their membership do they provide? And why that's important is it can help you determine how much you can invest in them being a member and staying a member, right? You know, if you know the lifetime value for them is $10,000, spending $100 over the course of a few years to, for postage for renewals or to invest in, 
um, you know, some sort of creative the stuff that's going out to your members is valuable because in the long run, you're, you know, well exceeding that investment. Um, and then another really important thing to know is the average ten tenure. So how long, once someone joins, how long are they likely to stay a member? Um, so we have these calculations and a few more in a PDF um, that will also explain each of them and why they're valuable. So we'll get that out to you and uh, you can take a look through that. And I'm, I would think too, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open um, as well um, if our emails are made available to you after the fact. So if there are questions as you're going through any of this afterwards, um, that, that you're more than welcome to reach out to Noah or I with any questions. Oh, totally. Yeah, no, great point, Jenna. So we'll get that handout. There's there's plenty of calculations. Um, I do want to get to Q and A's. I know Jan has been monitoring the Q and A section for me. Um, uh, listen, this is this is just a reminder, guys. Multi-channel works. I know. Again, it can be difficult at times to be in multiple places at once, but it really is becoming just absolutely dependent on being in paid digital, direct mail, email, phone, texting, and obviously local outreach. Like that's a, that's a big one for, for groups to, um, to obviously recruit, engage, and then help retain uh, members in the long run. So um, that's, that's a pretty basic slide. Um, but, you know, in conclusion, you know, for, for us today, I think uh, besides some of the potentially low hanging fruit uh, hacks or opportunities that could be integrated into recruitment campaigns or renewal campaigns, you know, from a membership lifecycle and marketing channel perspective, it's just important to make sure we're continuing to have the conversation about where we need to direct our attention. To Jana's point, it might even go to some of those calculations where, you know, our recruitment numbers are great, but we're not retaining a lot of our first year members. How can we do better on retaining first year members? Um, it's also about understanding not only association and industry pain points, but um, personal pain points, understand what people want, understand where other groups are struggling, you know, use that, investigate your own. Um, from a membership marketing perspective, what we really tried to do here today is, you know, what can you do and, and what works that, that you may not be using today that you could potentially implement and test that we've worked with a lot of groups over time to kind of prove work um, and that they're successful techniques. Um, and then to Jana's point, you know, last and most certainly not least, you know, calculate, 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 understand your members, your business, your membership roster. Um, and I do think those are, are key to helping you kind of get back to that top point we're needing, uh, get back to that top point of knowing where you need to direct your attention. So. Um, definitely want to save some time for Q and A's if there are any. Um, so, um, excited to, uh, turn it back over to, I think Lauren, you may coordinate here, right? Yeah. And thank you everyone. What a great chat and session so far. Thank you, Noah and Jana for all this amazing information. Um, we've had so many great questions come in and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, one of the questions that we received from Janine was the biggest issues that their potential members have are underutilization, low salary and career advancement, things that they cannot directly influence. Um, our, their biggest value right now has been inexpensive, inexpensive CE, the value of which um, has been diminished, though, given the availability of so much free CE now. So Will Gen X and millennials kind of join for the greater good of the profession? What are some ways that you think that they could be engaged? So I was gonna say, so I think, you know, with not Gen X so much, but millennials and Gen Z do have this more um, altruistic mindset, I think, than um, so that they want to be a part of something good. Um, they, um, you know, when, especially when they're joining or paying for something, they actually do want, they care about how this is going to impact things and, you know, what it kind of provides um, value wise. So, you know, I think that's a really good question. Um, but, you know, how to engage those. So, you know, the one thing I, you know, there you put, you know, sorry, I lost the question. Now I'm going to go here because it was here so I can read this is um, the things that you feel like you can't directly influence, but to really take a look at those to see, you know, what you could create, you know, this could be a, a good time to look and see, should we be offering new benefits? Should we have new products or services that really help to, a, to address 
those concerns. Um, you know, so, um, you know, career advancement, you know, what, you know, how can you help them along their career path and, and really use those pain points to help develop new um, benefits is I think really important um, because you have to speak to those pain points and you can't control everything, right? You can't control maybe their, their salary, um, right? But what could you do to help them negotiate salary better, right? You know, could you provide like mentorship or skills that people could go in and, um, or, you know, provide some sort of education that once they have that, you know, they could then go back and say, you know, I now have X, Y, Z. I think with that, I should, you know, have an X percent increase in salary. So I always just say to really look and really understand, you know, the pain points of your members um, and to develop um, tools, resources, whatever it might be to directly speak to those. Awesome. Um, Katie asks, what would be the best way to offer a welcome package to new members? Email, digital, what are the things that would be good to include? Yeah, and I kind of answered this too, and so I'll take this one, Noah, in the chat as well, um, because I was looking at our, at our survey, because we do ask that direct question and, and kind of what people are using. Um, and, and they're both still used. I think I said they get 36% of associations do an email welcome kit and 31% are doing a mail welcome kit. Mm -hmm. um, typically what you will see in those um, are a membership card. You know, some people still really value, you know, having a membership card, um, you know, ways for them to engage in, in the association. If they're, if you have like an online community or anything that you want them to get engaged with, send them information on that. Um, if you have like a magazine or any sort of flyers, publications, you know, you can cl include that in a, in a mail piece. Um, in emails too, what I recommend is, is not just that one welcome kit, um, but, you know, people that are doing monthly kind of onboarding engagement emails are those that are reporting some of the highest renewal rates. Mm -hmm. So yes, you know, do an email welcome kit. And in that welcome kit, you know, really kind of cover the basics, make sure, you know, they're introduced and I always say the most important thing in a welcome kit is to get them engaged from that welcome kit with your most valued benefit, right? So what is it in your association that when people are a member that if they take advantage of that, they are much more likely to renew, you know, that is the most valued. So mm -hmm. in that welcome kit from the get-go, get them to engage in that. Um, so I think either email or mail welcome kits uh, work well. You know, we've, you know, we had it reported that people who are doing email welcome kits have, you know, higher um, overall kind of engagements and renewal rates. So no matter how you're doing a welcome kit, I encourage you to do one, but don't stop at a welcome kit, you know, it, keep that outreach going throughout the, the, the course of the membership. That's awesome. Um, do you recommend paid social media advertising for not-for-profits? Um, and this person, Stephanie's in her personal experience in their business, it hasn't yielded much, um, but getting their name out in front of their actual audience um, is slow going so far. So do you find that to be pretty effective? And no, I think you can speak from NAFTA's experience here. Yeah, I was going to let Noah take this <laughs> Yeah, one. no, I, I will. And, and not just because I eat, sleep and breathe this too, um, but no, social media advertising um, for, for not-for-profits, it, it works to, to the point, you know, Stephanie, I think that you may be experiencing is that, yeah, target targeting can be um, a little difficult at times, but, you know, um, a great example that I like, it's, it's slightly a skew of, of social media, but with a lot of our groups and NAFTA included, um, we're now running Google search advertising. And what we love about Google search is that it's, intent-based marketing, right? So we are positioning ourselves to be able to answer questions based on people's pain points, their queries. Um, so like Google's a great one, but in terms of, yeah, social media advertising, we've had um, great success doing, um, doing targeting for NAVTA, but I think it, it may just be that, <laughs> I hate to say that maybe the niche group of the, the AZ vet techs in particular um, that makes it a, a little bit difficult, but they're there. Um, and it could be as simple as running um, organic social media posts that could, that could then get boosted. Um, Facebook allows um, you to run custom audience campaigns 
Um, so if there's opportunities to get data on people who have recently um, been credentialed or hold a credential, um, data like that can be loaded into Facebook. Um, and we can set up or you could set up targeted ad programs that reinforce joining for CE opportunities or joining for the networking or sharing best practices. Um, but yeah, we've absolutely seen uh, social media platform advertising work um, and, and provide, quite frankly, excellent ROI in almost all cases. And Noah, what would you kind of a follow up for that? Be like a healthy sort of budget or kind of what should people plan to spend um, around their campaigns, you know, knowing that um, these are volunteer associations with limited mm -hmm. resources. And so what do you think could be a good effective way for them to spend those dollars? Yeah, I mean, we've seen successful, like say Facebook paid campaigns run um, great on as little as, you know, 900 to a thousand dollars a month. Um, so it's, it's still a, a, a quality and decent investment, but the, the tricky part that we sometimes run into with the social media paid campaigns is there has to be a level of budget that makes us competitive in the marketplace. Um, so I doubt uh, Best Buy, for example, they're my favorite one to use. Um, I doubt they're coming in and, and exactly targeting um, Arizona veterinary technicians um, that same exact audience as you with, with quadruple the budget um, and they just blow you out of the water. Um, but, um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be, you know, $25,000, $30,000 a month. It can be $1,000, it can be $2,000. Um, but the digital campaigns are actually, um, it's a great opportunity. You know, Facebook's given a lot of folks opportunities to advertise on pretty limited budgets. So um, it and doesn't have to be, I was going to you know, the one nice thing with that is though, that you can be very specific in your targeting. I, I think of one group and this was, they actually doing it by accident, but, you know, running a Google search campaign, they're like, our numbers are really low. They had their targeting to one city in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> that was it. So, I mean, that's the level of targeting you can get on some of these. So, you know, you only want to reach people in Arizona. You only want to reach people in a certain region of Arizona. Uh, you're able to do that on, on a lot of these platforms that I think that way you can really optimize a small or very limited budget. Great. Yeah. And not to, not to uh, overtake the conversation, but just real quick, I, I did want to answer one question I see in the Q and a now um, for the, for the campaign that we ran extremely successfully in Q4 2022, uh, one of the most successful uh, message platforms that we set up was centered around uh, nav to discounts. And I will say, I want to I want to put a little disclaimer on that too because um, Lauren can confirm this, but we did that with the I think the dues increase right before the dues increase uh, officially happened. Um, so we saw great success um, with essentially creating. Uh, a FOMO campaign around, uh, make sure you renew um, and lock in this discounted rate. So um, we're testing more, we're going into CE testing or CE message platform testing, um, community and network uh, message testing. So there's a lot that we're gonna be working on here too that um, uh, from a national perspective will hopefully get shared down to um, chapter leaders, uh, either through leadership summit follow, leadership summit follow-ups or what have you, about um, successes we're seeing at the national level with some of the message uh, message testing we run. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, Noah and Jana, for joining us today. Um, this has been a really great session, and thank you everyone as well for participating in the chat. I think there was a lot of really great insights and tips shared um, with each other. We really appreciate your time um, and sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, I would like to invite everyone to join us for our next session um, at the summit, uh, Membership Engagement Tips and Techniques from Association Leaders, which will be beginning at 11.10 a.m. Um, the Zoom link for this webinar is being posted into the chat right now, um, so you should be able to use that to join once that session starts. And again, thank you so much, Noah and Jana, for joining us yeah. today.
and we'll see each hopefully see everyone at the next session thank you for having us yeah thank you for having us take care everyone bye y'all